Uh, good afternoon, good morning, whatever it is. We're at the cusp, I guess, of the day. Uh, I'm Bob Knight. I'm the director of the Florida Springs Institute. and Welcome you here today to Springs Academy Tuesdays. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, chemistry and basically environmental chemistry to uh, give you a background on understanding some of the numbers and some of the articles you see written in the paper and things like that. Um, and uh, I just want to welcome you for coming here. And if you have a chance and want to make a donation, we appreciate a $5 donation uh, for coming to the lectures. It's not required at all. And there's a little box here. Um, so this is one of six uh, lectures that I do in series. I've been doing monthly lectures on the first Tuesday of each month. Uh, this is we're actually in the second Tuesday of June. And July is going to be delayed also because of the 4th of July. This is my, my personal life gets in the way sometimes. So, uh, But today is Springs Chemistry, General Nutrients, Trace Contaminants. But in the first lecture, we talk about the, the overview of where the springs are in Florida, where they fit in uh, into the state of Florida. Uh, there, there are copies of previous lectures on our website, uh, the, the PowerPoint slides. Uh, actually, we filmed the last one, the hydrogeology lecture, so there's a complete video now. And that one really looked at the underground um, hydrology, where the water goes once it gets into the ground, uh, how it travels, uh, where it comes from, and what is happening with spring flows. This lecture is about chemistry, which is a uh, chemical property of water, basically what dissolves in water and how does that affect, how do springs affect that and how does that affect springs. The next lecture will be in July. It's on springs biology. Uh, we're actually going to have a guest lecturer that time because I won't be here that week. Uh, Rob Matson with the St. John's River Water Management District is an excellent biologist. He worked for years with the Suwannee River Water Management District as their biologist here on all the springs around here. He's been doing springs work for a long time. He'll give a great lecture on that day. Uh, August 1st is spring stresses, which are, um, there are many factors affecting our springs, and that's what we're interested in getting our arms around and doing something about in terms of better management of the springs. And so we'll go over those. And then there's a last lecture in September for the series. Uh, it's basically related to advocacy. The Springs Institute's been doing quite a bit of advocacy on behalf of springs. Uh, there are other organizations that are uh, taking up some of that challenge. And uh, we may have a guest speaker for that from a, a, a larger uh, advocacy group that is out there. So, And then we'll start the whole series over again in the fall, in October, uh, for any, if you miss any lectures and you want to round it out, you can always come to future ones. Um, so my background is uh, I have a PhD in uh, systems ecology, and I studied Silver Springs in particular for my doctoral research in the 1970s. I uh, then was an environmental consultant for about 35 years. I uh, still do a little bit of consulting, but uh, I've sold my consulting company and now I'm directing the Springs Institute. So this is what I do full time really now. Um, and I wrote this book, Silent Springs. If you don't have it, we sell it. It's back here in the corner uh, for $20, a $20 donation to the Springs Institute. Uh, and it's every, pretty much everything I know and everything I'll talk about today. It makes really good nighttime reading, I help, I hear it, it's much better than sleeping pills for helping you go to sleep. Uh, so uh, take that advice, that's, um, it's also in fairly large print, so it's, you know, a lot easier to read than smaller things. Um, so the purpose of the academy is to inform people like yourselves, uh, non-academic people for the most part, but some are academic, um, about uh, the issues specifically related to springs because all of us need to become advocates of springs if we care about springs, if we care about the future of water in Florida. If we don't speak up, um, then those people that have the money will triumph in terms of extracting all the available water and, uh, and, and destroying really our environment. And uh, that's an important thing for everybody to know how to speak up with, with knowledge uh, to the power of money. Uh, which is the main problem with springs right now. So we're trying to inform you. Uh, the Springs Institute is named after Howard T. Odom, who was my major advisor at college at University of Florida. 
he did the first major studies of springs in the 1950s at University of Florida, Silver Springs in particular, wrote the classic uh, references on springs. Uh, I'm just carrying on a tradition that he started. He wanted to start a springs institute. He never got around to it his career. He ended up doing inventing systems ecology and studying every level of system, both human and natural systems uh, that there are. Uh, but that's who I got to work with at Silver Springs and have gotten to work a lot more at Silver Springs to carry on his legacy. One of the things he wrote in his 1957 paper is that about chemistry of springs is each spring differs from the others by a few factors. Thus there are chloride springs, calcium springs, sulfate springs, springs with high and low oxygen, saline springs, soft water springs, and other types. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to give you some knowledge about that. Springs aren't all the same. There are more than a thousand springs in North Florida, but they're not all the same by any means. And so we'll, I'm going to go over the physical properties of water so you have a basic understanding uh, that you need to have, you need to know about water to understand water chemistry. And then we're going to talk about environmental chemistry, which is mostly the chemistry of water. And we'll talk about some of the important, most important parameters or um, um, elements and, and chemical compounds that are dissolved in water and about the variability of springs. So uh, if, you, if you have any questions, if there's something that you really want to understand better and I didn't explain it well enough, because I'm going to cover a lot of ground in the next hour, uh, you can stop me and I'll try to give you a short answer. I'll talk about the physical properties of water. Uh, what temperature is, what density of water is, how light interacts with water. And then I'm going to talk about really the chemistry of water. Uh, water is a universal solvent. That's what it's called because it dissolves almost all uh, chemical compounds. Um, and some definitions. And I'll compare springs water quality and what the trends are. So water is an incredibly simple molecule. It's uh, a oxygen and two hydrogen. Uh, so it's uh, a, a chemical compound of two hydrogens and one oxygen for each molecule. Uh, and so it, it, it looks like a Mickey Mouse, uh, fat Mickey Mouse, uh, with the oxygen is much bigger and uh, heavier. It's like a, a, a molecular weight of 16, while the hydrogen have a molecular weight of 1. So they're much smaller atoms. And the oxygen atom uh, is, is polarized so that the hydrogen atoms uh, cling to the oxygen basically at one end which makes the water molecule polar. It, it basically has a, it's like a, a small magnet. It's got a plus in and a minus in. The minus is down here, the plus is up here. And that gives water m many of its unique properties. In fact, just the way these atoms uh, arrange each with each other uh, gives water all its properties that are, affect everything about life on Earth, water being the most uh, important uh, compound in uh, affecting life. And that's why when, they, when they're looking at Mars, they want to know if there was water on Mars. Because if there was water, there was probably life on Mars. And of course, they find, they're finding evidence of that. Anyway, I'm going to go over some of the unique properties of water. Water has one of the highest specific heats of any liquid. Uh, and specific heat is just the amount of heat it takes to change the temperature of something, the specific heat. In other words, some, some liquids are easily warmed up with a little bit of energy input. Others take a lot more energy and put in water is one of the ones that has the highest specific heat, which means that uh, once you warm up a mass of water, it stays warm. It, 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 it's give, uh, taking in heat and, and releasing heat. Water is a buffering action. And so if you have a lake near where your house or you see orange groves near a lake, there's a reason for that. It's because the climate is being controlled by the mass of water that's there. The ocean, if you're at the coast, you have less temperature variation day and night and over the year than you do if you're inland, for example. And that's because of water-specific heat properties. Water is, like I said, it's two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom. Uh, it dissociates uh, to a certain extent. A very small concentration of the water is dissociated, and so the hydrogens have been released. They're what's called ions. So when you have an atom that's by itself and it's got a charge, it's called an ion. And the positive ions are cations, the negative ions are called anions. And so hydrogen is a cation, and oxygen is an anion, and it separates in water. And that's what gives uh, 
the property of pH. The, the a pH doesn't mean anything other than it's the, it's the negative log of the amount of hydrogen ions in a, in a solution. But you know what pH is when you pick up, put a drop of battery acid on your finger and it burns right through your skin. Or when you take some bleach and put it on you and you feel real slimy because your skin's dissolving. Uh, those are, a acid is very low pH, in other words, and that's a very high concentration of hydrogen ions. And uh, bleach is a very high pH, which is the opposite. So this is a negative, um, uh, a me measure of the negative logarithm, and I won't try to explain that anymore, but any pH, pH, pure water has a pH of seven, and when it dissociates, it's got an equal number of hydrogen ions and an equal number of hydroxide ions, which is the, the OH part of water. And uh, pure water is seven, it's completely neutral, and that's um, very, that, that's very conducive to life. If you go outside that pH range too far, it starts killing things. And it turns out rainwater has a natural pH of about 5.6, and that's, that's on the acidic side. Rainwater is acidic because it has carbon dioxide that dissolves into it. You know, the atmosphere is about three and a half to four percent carbon dioxide. Uh, that's what we expel when we breathe, and that's what plants use for their nutrients. And, you hear about the greenhouse effect, and that's because of the carbon, rising carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels is fueling greater plant growth in the world, too, because that's the nutrient that they use. But anyway, there's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and it dissolves in the water, and, and based on the current concentration of carbon dioxide, if there was nothing else dissolved in the water, you'd have an acidic pH, which becomes really important later on when I'm talking about limestone and, and conduits in, in the aquifer and caves and cave diving. That's, those cavities are from the acidity of water. It actually dissolves limestone. This rainwater dissolves limestone. You can also have other things dissolved in water that give it a high pH. And one of those things is calcium carbonate. The limestone itself, when it dissolves, you get a, a pH of about 7.4 on average uh, in, in when water is in contact with limestone. And our groundwater is in contact with limestone. It's completely, you know, surrounded by limestone. And so the average pH of springs is 7.4. It's on the basic side. Acid is the low pH, basic is the high. I'm going to come back to that. But anyway, that's because of the unique properties of water. Water conducts heat very readily. So a, a body of water tends to have the same temperature from one side to the other because it conducts heat. Uh, and water. The real miracle of water is that it's a, it's a liquid at the normal temperatures that we live at, and that's really important. Imagine if water was just a vapor. How would we drink? Imagine if water was always ice, and, and you had to heat it up an enormous amount. You know, how would you drink? You can't drink ice, you can't drink vapor. Uh, you have to drink liquid water, and fish live in liquid water, and you know, everything about our life is, I look around this place, you see water in every picture in this place, because it is, it's life. Uh, that water also is a universal solvent. Uh, it'll dissolve almost any chemical. Petroleum chemicals don't dissolve in water. That's why you see, you know, gasoline floating on water and things like that. But almost, almost every other chemical compound uh, dissolves in water, which means that those things can be moved around. That's how nutrients get to plants. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, those nutrients that are needed by plants. If they didn't dissolve in water, the plants wouldn't be able to take them up through their roots. They'd have to have, we'd have to have a totally different life support system in this world if uh, water didn't dissolve these things. Water has a surface tension, and it's sort of another reason why plants can pull water up through their roots is because water adheres to things because of its polarity, it's the fact that it's uh, ionic. Uh, I, th I think I forgot to mention, but if you, you, if you put a magnet, a uh, strong magnet next to a stream of water coming out of your faucet, it'll actually move the water. And, and that's because water's got a, a charge to it. Um, it. Test me on that. I haven't done it for a while. But um, so water has surface tension. That's why it clings to the side of a glass. That's why it forms droplets, like I showed at the beginning. That's absolutely essential for life as we know it. That's why water moves through plants and can be moved all the way up to the top of a 100 foot tree, is because of that surface tension. Uh, like I said, is, is a fairly constant temperature in one area. In Florida, groundwater uh, temperature is, is almost precisely equal to the average annual 
uh, environmental temperature on the outside. So if you're in Tallahassee, springs are colder than they are in Gainesville than they are in uh, uh, Orlando, for example. And in North Florida, the springs average about as low as 20 degrees centigrade or 69, 68 degrees up in the Tallahassee area in the Panhandle. They're about uh, 24 degrees in Central Florida and uh, 29 degrees in South Florida springs are warmer because the average annual temperature is higher. And so the ground is a great insulator also. The ground insulates the groundwater that's in it. And, it, and it's like having a house in a cave. You've always heard that if you build a cave, you don't need an air conditioner, you don't need a heater really, because it will stay the same temperature all the time. That's the way the water is in the ground. So springs in North Florida are, tend to be, have colder water than ones in Central Florida or in South Florida. There's also a, a thermal gradient of water that's in the earth itself. So warm mineral springs, the reason it's warm, uh, it, it runs at about 30 uh, degrees centigrade, is, is because the water's coming from a very deep vent, over 200, 250 feet deep, if that water's coming up. And there's an increase of about one degree centigrade for every 100 foot of depth. Uh, and so that, that's why that water is warmer. We don't have many warm mineral springs up here, but they have lots in other parts of the country. And so that's, that's interesting. Um, I'm going to turn to light now. Light is, you know, we take water for granted, we take light for granted, we take color for granted. We take a lot of things for granted, unfortunately. But I mean, that's cool because that lets us get around the rest of our business, like the things we can't take for granted, um, like what side of the road you're driving on and things like that. But anyway, light is one of the things we take for granted. We're surrounded by it all the time except when you're down in a cave or you're uh, you know, uh, in a very dark room. And light is it's electromagnetic energy. And here's a spectrum that we commonly deal with, uh, powers of 10, from 10 to the 4th to 10 to the 18th. Uh, that's from radio waves. We're surrounded by radio waves. Um, you can put a radio receiver anywhere here and pick up radio waves, right? They're, we're, we're bombarded by them continuously. They're very long wavelengths. Of, of electromagnetic energy. Gamma rays, uh, we hope we're not bombarded by those, but there are some making it through all the time. They cause some cancers. Uh, they, they are important. Uh, microwaves, our microwave oven is of long, fairly long waves. Infrared light is uh, long waves. X-rays are short. But anyway, of that whole spectrum of 14 powers of 10, there's this narrow little spectrum of visible light. Every, all the visible light that we deal with is in this spectrum right here, and it goes from infrared to ultraviolet. And this is what you see in a rainbow, obviously, is when you spread that spectrum out in a certain way with, through rain droplets in a rainbow. You see this, this is the arrangement of the light on a, on a rainbow, uh, coming from a rainbow. But this is, this is the range of light that is used by all living things, us for vision, plants for their productivity. They've got to have light in a certain range here, in the blue range, to uh, do primary productivity, which provides all our food. So anyway, this is an important range. And light is, uh, comes to us differently, of course, where we are on the globe. In Florida, these are actual data from Florida, measurements of light. And this is called photo, photosynthetically active radiation, which is the, the, the light that plants can actually use. We actually measure that separately from total incoming light. Uh, but this just shows you the, the, how light changes during time in Florida. So in the, er, in the late spring and early summer, you have the maximum highest light uh, uh, of during the year, and the lowest is in January, typically. But every day is different. You know, every day, every one of these dots is a different day. This is a study we did at Silver Springs. And so some days, Silver Springs in the, in the winter got essentially no light. It was just dark, you know, how it is when it was raining here last week, week before, how dark it was all day. Uh, other days, you're getting the maximum amount of light. But anyway, you see it follows a, a sinusoidal pattern. This just confirms what we all know. The Earth is tilted, and it gets different amounts of sunlight in the summer and in the winter. But that's very important in springs. OK, how, what happens when light hits water? Well, some of the light makes it through the water. Some of it uh, is absorbed by the water, which uh, raises the temperature of the water. So a lake gets warmer when it's sunny. And, uh, and colder when it's not sunny. Um, uh, some of the light reaches the bottom and bounces back. If, if the water's clear, you can see the bottom. That means light is making it back from the bottom 
It's reflected from the bottom coming back to your eyes and you can actually see it. Silver Springs, you can still see the bottom most of the time, not all the time. Um, and uh, and what's, what's the light look like when it comes back? Well, the water looks blue and, and pure water, it it's, looks blue if it's deep. You know, you go out in the ocean and the Gulf Stream or something like that, the water's blue. That's because blue light travels the furthest. All the other colors are absorbed by the water, by pure water, uh, before blue. And so the only light returning to your eyes is the blue light when you got pure uh, water. And you look around at the Springs pictures, you'll see they were all, almost all blue in the past. That's the color, the natural color we think of for Springs. Um, but that, that is changing. So. Some of the light is lost to absorption, which actually heats the water. Some of the light is lost to just reflection off, off of particles. So those are the two ways that light is diminished as it goes through water. We measure this when we do our spring studies. We take our interns out and they have a light meter and they measure how less light there is with depth and we come up with an absorption coefficient. And uh, the absorption is highest for infrared, light, remember that's a long wavelength, minimal for the, the other end, and in, in ultraviolet, um, uh, it, it increases beyond blue. 53% uh, of the light is generally transformed to heat within one meter, 3.2 feet, in the water column. So you're losing over half of the light coming into, even a clear water, you're losing about half the light in the upper one meter. So it may be in the ecosystem's best interest to be growing all the plants up near the top of the water, and sometimes some plant communities you see that, submerged aquatic plants and things like that. Um, but you can get too much light. Light is harmful, as you all know, if you get sunburn. Um, organic compounds in the water reduce the transmission of light, absorbs it, and what it does is uh, all the, the dissolved organic matter absorbs UV to a greater degree than other wavelengths, so it's getting the bluish end of the spectrum, and, uh, but particulates don't absorb selectively, they just, uh, uh, reflect, and uh, so in pure water, blue light penetrates the deepest. Uh, the the backscatter is predominantly blue light in clear water, but when you have calcium carbonate like Manatee Springs, sometimes I don't know if you've been there when it looked uh, milky. Have you ever seen it milky? That's because that's because there's there's a high concentration. Of the, I, I'm sure that's from sinkholes and collapses in the aquifer in that area. Um, it's it's uh, the the milky color. It turns blue-green. Green, more and more of our springs are turning green, and that's because of a little bit of organic matter. For example, Poe Springs used to be a blue spring when I took my kids there 30-some years ago. It's green or brown now a lot of the time because some of the river water has gotten into the aquifer there, and uh, as the springs have backflowed, and then they flow with uh, tannic water. And a little bit of tannic water goes a long ways to make a spring green. And so when you see springs where the water itself looks green, that's not from the algae that's growing, that's from the actual light um, absorption properties of the water. The water has changed because of the organic matter. Um, so we have quick and dirty ways to measure light transmission. One is with a Secchi disk, which is just a white disk or a white and black disk that we lower down in the water until it disappears. And that works fine in the Santa Fe when it's tannic. You can go down and maybe see it two or three feet or maybe three or four meters. Uh, but in the spring, that doesn't work. So oftentimes we turn the Secchi disk horizontally and read it horizontally uh, between two observers where one is holding it and another one is, keeps swimming away until you can't see the disk anymore. The highest Secchi disk readings that we've gotten in springs are over 300 feet. 300 feet, that's the length of a football field. Okay, that's pretty far. Um, and, and that's Silver Springs, Rainbow Springs, uh, Wikiwashi Springs, right at the spring boil. The water is so pure. Uh, that you can see through it. I'm going to go over some of the uh, chemical compounds that are important in water. I'll try to do this a little faster, but uh, so anyway, I'll, I'll touch on each of these. Acidity is the uncombined carbon dioxide, organic acids such as tannic acids, humic acids, mineral acids, and salts of strong acids. They're, they're basically compounds dissolved in water that make it acidic and neutralize the basic compounds like calcium carbonate. Anyway, that's a measurement of water that's done by laboratories. Acidity. Do you ever do that one? Probably not. We have a chemist here in front. We have several chemists. pH I talked about, and this is the range. Battery acid is very low pH. Lye is very high pH. 
Uh, water, pure water is neutral at seven. Um, so a Coca-Cola, they say, is about two. Uh, acid rain actually got down to uh, acidity, uh, to pHs as low as one, and it just wiped out the fish populations and the plants in many of the northern lakes. And that, was, that acid rain was created from power plant discharges of, of carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere that makes the rain much more acidic. Uh, even milk is slightly acidic. Baking soda, seawater, they're basic on the other end. Carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, I said, is a gas. It's carbon, a carbon and two oxygens. Uh, so it's a heavier molecule than water. Uh, but it dissolves, all gases dissolve to some extent in water. Uh, and carbon dioxide is one of those. Like that's how plants get their uh, carbon for making plant material, the aquatic plants. Uh, but carbon dioxide, depending on the pH of the water, is in different forms. And when carbon dioxide and water make carbonic acid, which is a, a weak acid that is made from uh, the hydrogen uh, in the water and the oxygen and carbon make carbonic acid. That dissociates into um, different forms, uh, bicarbonate, and you've heard about bicarbonate, and at least if you're as old as I am, they used to use it as a medicine of some kind. Um, and carbonate is the, the, the straight carbonate uh, uh, anion uh, from a limestone, and you got free CO2. So at a neutral pH, uh, most of the, the uh, carbon in the water is in the bicarbonate form. As the pH goes up a little, well, actually, this is beyond neutral. This is about eight and a half. So in springs, you're pretty much, you got free CO2 and bicarbonate because they tend to be around seven and a half pH. But very basic water, it's, it's pure carbonate. I talked about color. Uh, well, I talked about light before. This is actually a spring. This is Fanning Springs after one of these inversions where the river. Too. Yeah, this is where the river has come. You've got about 150 buzzards sitting above the springs out there eating the fish yeah. until they die. The, um, and you see the green color. This is the actual you know, uh, way the color looks when there's tannic acid in, uh, dissolved in it. So color is something we measure in the laboratory. There's uh, platinum. Uh, uh, units uh, for the color measurement. Dissolved oxygen, uh, you know, most of the air around us, the other thing we take for granted, obviously, is dissolved oxygen, which we absolutely need to survive and would die if we just went into a room for a few minutes with no oxygen, we'd be dead. Uh, it's 80% of the air around us is oxygen. Uh, it's not dissolved, it's here, it's oxygen gas. But in water, because the gas is in contact with water, a certain amount dissolves in the water, and it's called dissolved oxygen. Uh, water dissolves everything, just about, including oxygen. Um, and so that, you, don't, you can't see that oxygen in the water, but you can measure it. You, we have um, analytical procedures, either in the laboratory through titrations or with um, instruments now, that we can actually measure the oxygen dissolved in the water. And springs are highly different in the amount of oxygen they, they have because of the difference in the groundwater travel that's going on and how long that water's been underground. But that oxygen is very important for the biology of springs. So it's a very important thing to understand. Oxygen is really strange. Most things that dissolve in water, uh, more of them typically dissolves at higher temperatures when the water's at a higher temperature than a lower temperature, not oxygen. It's the exact opposite. There's more oxygen at equilibrium at col with colder water than there is in warmer water. So it really screws you up if you're trying to just figure things out off the top of your head. Um, so the, uh, like the um, saturated uh, concentration of oxygen in, 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 in the winter would be eight and a half parts per million of oxygen, uh, while in the summer it would be about five or six parts per million. It's, just, it's a difference of uh, 20, 30 percent. Chloride. Uh, Sodium chloride is the salt that makes the ocean salty. That's the primary salt. And that's a chloride. Um, uh, sodium is a uh, cation, and, and, and chloride, chlorine, is an anion. And uh, chloride is the, the stable form of chlorine. Uh, you think you, you put chlorine in your pool as well. You're actually putting dissolved chloride into your pool. Um, and so sodium chloride is one way of getting that. That's what's in salt water. And that's really important because uh, it's very conservative in the environment. When you put chloride 
or chlorine into a system, it tends to stay there. Chlorine doesn't. Chlorine gas will go out, but half of the, the chlorine you put in your pool stays in the water. It actually makes it saltier, and the other half uh, eventually comes out as gas. So when that chloride, when we salt our food and then flush our toilets and they go into a septic tank and they go into the aquifer, that's all carrying chloride into the aquifer. Uh, all our wastewater treatment is carrying chloride into the aquifer. Uh, the aquifer itself, as I'll say later on, is surrounded by salt water. So it, there's naturally high chloride in parts of the aquifer, the underground aquifer. And, and there's, so there's some really neat things happening with chloride, like some people's water is going salty and they can't drink it anymore because their groundwater has gone salty and saltwater intrusion is a very big deal in Florida. There's a lot more to come. Uh, it's not the end of the story. Um, and and that we measure that with chloride. Uh, specific conductance is a test you, you do with an instrument. It basically says how well does water conduct electricity. And that it conducts electricity because these ions I was telling you about, the, the cations like the positive ones, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and the anions like chloride or chlorine, uh, sulfate, carbonate. And, and so the, the more of these uh, ions are in the water, the more the conductance is. So it tends, uh, salt water, I mean, spring water has high conductivity. Salt water is very high conductivity, and it's a very easy thing to measure. So we measure it in the field a lot to, once again, sort of track where water is coming from and where it's going to. A few other tests, total dissolved solids. You basically take a sample of water and dry it uh, completely and weigh the residue that's left. So uh, all these things that are dissolved in water, you can't see, and some of them you can't taste like nitrate, you can't taste it. Oxygen, you can't taste it. You can taste chloride for that, and that's one that our, our evolution taught us how to taste. Uh, but there's a lot of things dissolved in water and that you can't see them, you don't know they're there, unless because of calcium and magnesium that's dissolved in the water and it has a hard, high total dissolved solids because of these other things. Alkalinity is a measure of basically uh, those things that can neutralize acidity, so it's the basic compounds that are dissolved in water, like carbonate as one, or hydroxide, those things will uh, neutralize acidity in water. So I, that's a lot of science, and, and, and I apologize for that, but I think it's important you at least have seen those terms so you know where to go on Wikipedia to find the, the facts in case, in case you ever need to look them up. Uh, this, this young gentleman, I don't remember his first name, but in 2004 published his master's thesis that evaluated water quality in 109 different springs, so I use this. Springs tend to have an alkaline or basic pH 7.4. They have a, a measurable alkalinity 137, which is reported as uh, equivalence of, of calcium carbonate. They're chemically rich, in other words, they have a fairly high specific conductance, 713 of these micro siemens per centimeter, which is just a standard unit, and they have a relatively high, high hardness. So uh, Florida's groundwaters from the Florida aquifer, which I'll talk about, what I talked about last time, um, tends to be hard. It has a lot of things dissolved in it. And the, the things that are dissolved in it are especially the calcium carbonate from the limestone that it's in. There's also dolostone in our aquifer, which is a sulfate-rich uh, calcium magnesium compound, uh, stone, that dissolves. And so you get magnesium, you get calcium, and you get sodium and chloride because there's relic seawater in some parts of our aquifer that tend to raise uh, the amount of those elements. And so the water's hard, it's alkaline, it has a relatively high pH, it's got a high conductivity. And those are ways you can tell groundwater. You go out here and put a can out and catch some rainfall, it's gonna have very low levels of all these things. It's the pH is going to be acidic instead of basic. It's going to be, uh, uh, conductivity is going to be around 20 or 30 instead of 700 or 300. Um, and all these things are going to be much lower. Rainwater is what we call soft water. Groundwater here we call is hard water. And, and you know when you get it on your sink and you don't clean it off fast enough, it leaves minerals. That's like doing a total dissolved solid study in your sink. And I've got a lot of that, and there's some in the bathroom here because people didn't clean the toilet enough. So yes? A question. If you were watering your garden, you had a choice between salt and hard water. Since hard water has minerals, would you be better to water your garden with hard water? Uh, I don't think so. I, th I think uh, most plants are adapted to rain and not groundwater. 
but you know the groundwater's got so much nitrogen in it now that you probably could save on fertilizer just by using the groundwater. <laughs> but I don't, I don't want to encourage it. In fact, I have an article that'll be coming out in the Sunday paper this next weekend about when it rains, it pours. And it, it does not encourage irrigation with groundwater. Fluoride is a natural element, naturally occurring element that occurs in our limestone. And we have radium and other things too that are very low concentration. But and they started adding it. <laughs> Yeah. No, I think uh, drinking the groundwater here is, is fairly good for humans, except for the nitrate, because of the minerals in the, in the water. Uh, DI dissolved, I mean, um, distilled water is not tasty. It doesn't taste right. Um, so having minerals in the water is, is good for drinking. But soft water is not bad either. Rainwater, you could drink rainwater all the time and be healthy. It's just that you need some calcium and stuff like that in your water. If you could taste it, yeah, if we could see the nitrate in it, I would love that. <laughs> we may already be there. Uh, I've got some wells at 1,400. Okay, so the springs have been classified based on their water quality. Way back in the 50s, uh, Whitford worked with Odom at Silver Spring. There's, there's springs, I have a, a small piece of land over by La Crosse. I call it Seven Springs Farm. There's, there's a ravine on my property and there's seven little springs around it that feed water to a creek. It's, it's, that creek's flowed for the last 40 years. I used to get my drinking water from one of those springs. They're soft water springs. They are basically rainwater that's infiltrated through sand and not through limestone, hit the, the confining layer, in this case clay, and comes out in the spring. That's called a seep or a, a, it's a spring any place where groundwater comes to the, the surface is a spring, but a seepage spring is one like that, where the rain is just seeped in and flowed out under the influence of the gravity of the land around it. Um, but our artesian springs are different. They're basically responding to uh, pressure changes over a large area. And um, hey, come on in uh, and join us. Um, and the artesian springs have. Um, variable chloride, depending on how much salt water is around, they may not have much chloride in them. Uh, so they're low chloride, but hard water springs. And then there's springs that are mesohaline, which means partially salty um, with uh, elevated chlorides. And then we have sulfur springs too, because some of the rocks that are in the limestone have sulfate in them, and that dissolves also. And so we get sulfur rich uh, groundwater in some cases. And then we have some springs that are just nasty as hell. They're salt and sulfate. Well, that was the last lecture. It, 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 um, our Florida aquifer is mostly confined, and most of the aquifer is covered with clay. And so the water actually can build up in pressure depending on where it's being recharged. And that pressure is um, released when the water comes to a sinkhole or basically a spring. A spring is just a hole through the limestone that allows the water to escape. Yeah, you can see an artesian spring would be one where you actually see a boil on the surface, typically. Uh, that means there's artesian pressure uh, that's pressurized. That water's under pressure, and uh, it's, it'll come out, you know, with a slight boil or a big boil, depending on how much pressure there is. But um, it, if you go back to the last lecture, you can see all that about the potentiometric surface, the surface of the uh, aquifer. We can't actually measure the potentiometric surface directly. Uh, we put wells in, and the water will rise in a well up. There, there'll be a confining layer that the water normally wouldn't be above, but in a well, it'll come up because it's open to the atmosphere. And by mapping a lot of wells, we can figure out where that pressure surface is of the aquifer. And that, that's what drives our artesian springs. The thousand springs I'm talking about are artesian springs. And here's some of them. Here's Manatee, your favorite spring. Uh, and. Uh, these were monitored uh, very extensively uh, for a period of time by the Florida Springs Initiative. The Department of Environmental Protection really came up with a, a great program for about 10 years, but all these springs were being intensively monitored for this period. So we have a, a large database. So for every spring, there are good data. 
So we can look at the temperature variation. Here we see warm mineral springs, 30.2 degrees. Wasissa Springs up in Jefferson County, 20 degrees. Um, Silver Springs uh, averaging 23 degrees. Uh, Itchtuckney averaging 20, around 22 degrees. So, so we have good data from a lot of these systems. The dissolved oxygen, very highly variable, uh, very high in Rainbow Springs, for example, four to six. Uh, some of the springs at Silver are very low. Uh, some are actually down in one area and, and some go up to four. Uh, and then you got um, another spring like warm mineral springs, very low oxygen. So here's the conductance. Alexander Springs is a salty spring. It's got fairly high chloride, 230 milligrams of chloride. Well, you have some springs like Jackson Blue, only four milligrams per liter of chloride, no, no salt water really in it. Um, but in Crystal, Crystal River, the spring's chloride levels are going way up because of salt water intrusion in Citrus County. Um, and then um, a lot of the Silver Glen, those springs down along the uh, St. John's River, a lot of them have high conductivity and high chloride. So uh, Crystal River, yep, the conductivity is getting high. All the minerals are higher. So anyway, there are references like this that, that I can give you or point you to if you need to know more specifically what the, t what the chemistry is of different springs. Uh, one, of the one of the DEP's reports in 2010 ranked all the springs based on their dissolved oxygen concentration. You see Jackson Blue has got the highest oxygen on average seven, basically it's saturated. Rainbow is next and the Juniper. And then you got springs all the way like Hornsby and Wakaiwa and DeLeon and Troy that are down at almost zero oxygen. And then there's a whole range of them. So our springs are highly variable in the amount of oxygen. We think the amount of oxygen in the groundwater and the spring water is related to how old the water is, how long it's been since it went into the ground. So if it's very old water, it would have old, uh, very low oxygen. If it's younger water, it'd have very high oxygen. And that's, we think, the hydrogeology of Jackson Blue Springs up at Mariana is one of where the water's gone into the aquifer, which is real near the ground surface, and moved very quickly to the spring. And so the deeper, older water is not coming out of the spring. It's the younger water that's on top. We also see nitrate levels are related to the age of the water because the nitrates that we're putting on the land surface is on the surface of the aquifer. It's not mixed all the way down into the deeper parts of the aquifer. So where there's younger water coming out, we have much higher nitrate levels, like at Rainbow. At Jackson Blue and Rainbow are two of the highest springs in terms of um, nitrate levels. And Fanning's a high one too, but it's got lower oxygen. So none of these things are, are iron-clad rules. The, Dissolved solids, the calcium and sulfate on a log scale here are plotted out for these springs. Uh, so we have a lot of data for some of these things, some great reports. Uh, we, we did some detailed studies on silver. Uh, Mammoth Cave is the, about half of the water at Silver Springs comes out of one spring vent, Mammoth Cave. It's got two internal vents in it that have been measured. They have very different quality water because they're coming from different veins in the aquifer. I mean, the, these 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 conduits that are bringing water to the springs are just like the veins going to your heart. That's just what they're like. And they vary in size, they're very random. Uh, but silver's got two major ones, and they're, they're different enough in temperature. Uh, these are DO, but they're very different in, D, in dissolved oxygen. One's putting on an average of 39% saturation, the other one's 13%. So this one's got 1 1.2 milligrams per liter of oxygen, this one's got 3.35. and, and um, uh, they also, they, their temperatures are different enough, you know this is a cold vent, this is a warm vent. And they're only different by a few tenths of a degree, but that, you know, that's different age water. Uh, this is downstream in the Silver River. Um, you can actually see the effect of, of light. This is the daily pattern of light from, from 360, more than 400 days actually, all rolled into one graph, one 24 hour period. You can see at night, the temperature gets a little lower in the Silver River and then comes up during the day. It goes up a half a degree because of the massive flow of the Silver River, and this is uh, almost a mile downstream, uh, the temperature only goes up one uh, half a degree. And these are the ranges over that whole uh, year period. Uh, so winter and spring and summer and fall, but it, it averages around 23. Uh, the conductance hardly changes at all uh, because that's not affected by sunlight. It's not affected by atmospheric CO2. It's, it's affected by the amount of carbonate that's dissolved in the water from the, from the limestone. 
Okay, that's sort of the water quality as a snapshot in different springs. What happens over time? Well, we have some good data from Silver Springs. The earliest data published are 1907. Sulfate went from 44. Uh, in 1946, it was measured as 34. In 2004, we did a much another detailed study with 46. Almost no change in sulfate in Silver Springs over 100, uh, more than well, almost 100 years. Alkalinity. The alkalinity actually went down a little bit in Silver Springs. And alkalinity is a measure of the, the carbonates in the water. For some reason, uh, the uh, amount of carbonate dissolved in the water is going down. Chlorides went up at Silver Springs measurably. I mean, they almost doubled in this 100-year period. This is what I'm talking about with salt water. We, we, by pumping the groundwater, either we're bringing more of the deep salt water up. Uh, we know we're doing that. It's called upconing. Uh, but also, with our wastewater, we're applying more uh, chlorides to the water, groundwater all the time through our wastewater dis discharges. Calcium was very constant. So here we have two things, sulfate and calcium. They're almost unchanged in Silver Springs after 100 years. Magnesium was constant. Potassium is going down for some reason. I don't know why. Sodium is going up like chlorides. Sodium and chlorides are associated with salt, salt or salt water. So those are some interesting trends. Here's some trends published by the St. John's River Water Management District. All these things are going up. Total dissolved solids. This is at Ponce de Leon Springs. This is where the pancake place is. If you ever go to Ponce or de Leon Springs, uh, north of Volusia Blue Springs. Um, the chlorides are going up uh, pretty severely in that spring. This is a logarithmic scale, which means it's really much higher than these graphs indicate. Sulfate's going up. Uh, and this, this spring along the St. John's River is capturing more and more of that relic seawater that's in that area of, of the aquifer in that part of Florida. The only thing that's not going up is phosphorus in the spring. Nitrate's going up. And, and those are true. Uh, here's a totally a different graph from Rainbow Springs. Uh, chloride going up at Rainbow. Uh, Copeland did this uh, paper in 2009 that indicated most of our springs, the chloride levels are going up. And this is a scary phenomena that we are gradually now, but it could become, it, there could be a tipping point where we turn our whole freshwater aquifer salty, too salty to use. This is actually a possibility that is, um, may take on the appearance of reality sometime. <laughs> um, Fanning Springs, uh, this is specific conductance, which is a measure of chlorides. This is just a narrow part of the range, but it's gone up a lot from 300 to 450. Uh, it's a pretty big increase. Uh, pH is going down in a lot of our springs. Uh, we don't know exactly why that is, but it's, it's, I think it's with that decline in, in carbonates. Um, that probably means uh, younger water that hasn't been in the aquifer as long. pH is increase, uh, decreasing the majority of our springs. Conductance is going up in a majority of our springs. Chloride's going up based on that's that study here. So it's very important for people to know that Florida is, is a stone platform and it's high. It's like um, Florida is basically limestone deposited on a um, you know metamorphic rock uh, that's part of Pangaea when the con continent separated. Uh, there was this platform of old, old rock um, and, and the limestone built up on it and when the sea level was over Florida because it was, it was sort of a uh, pedestal and, and the marine organisms built limestone on top of that over the 40 million years, the last 40 million years. And it's now that limestone um, and, and the Florida platform is thousands of feet thick. I mean, right where we stand here, I think it's over 3,000 feet thick. Uh, and then you're on the basalt, you know, when you go, when you drill through that, uh, you can actually drill through that, but there's very few wells that go that deep. But most of that limestone is full of salt water. It's, it's because the ocean's all around Florida. And so when Florida was under the sea, all of the limestone was full of salt water, right? It was salt water. It was flooded by salt water. There was no rain getting into it. And then as sea levels declined, and it kept, it rained and it rained and rained because we're an island basically in the ocean. Um, the fresh water displaced the salt water and that's been happening over a long period of time. So right here in the middle of the state where we are, 
The freshwater lens is thought to be a couple thousand feet thick. It almost fills the aquifer to the bottom. If you go to the coast, it becomes very thin. It, in fact, it pinches out to no, not thick at all at the coast. Uh, so there's like a bubble. I call it like a, like a water bed of, of fresh water floating on the dense water. Interface changes this transition zone where you can actually see when you drill a well and you sample water down through the well, you can see as you get into this transition zone and it uh, becomes saltier. Um, and we know that um, this level, this transition zone, moves up and down depending on how much fresh water is up here. As we pull down the water level in the springs or in the aquifer up here, which we've been doing through pumping, uh, that comes up. In fact, it comes up for every foot that we lower the aquifer level, the transition zone comes up 40 feet because of the difference in density between salt water and fresh water. So as we lower this at the surface, there's a, a very a much larger, 40 times larger rise in that, that uh, boundary. Uh, the, the density of fresh water is, uh, that's water, fresh pure water is used as the, um, the index of density, of water of density. It's one cubic centimeter equals one gram. That's the way we define density, okay? So water has a density of one. Salt water with um, uh, 30 parts per thousand of salt, uh, or 35, whatever it is, uh, has a density of about 1.2. 1.1 or 1.2, and it's the ratio in those densities. It's explained in the book. There's a there's a little explanation in the book that I got out of Wikipedia. Uh, it's called the Gribben Hertzberg effect, and uh, it, the calculation is really not. It doesn't take a genius to do the calculation, but it's shown in the book, and uh, it says for every decline of of h, uh, one unit of h, you get a 40 foot change in z because of the, that difference in density, because one's 1 1.000 and one's 1 1.12 or something like that. And it's, it's a 40 to one difference because of that. In lay terms, you said salt water has the capacity to contaminate the fresh water. Is the greatest proportion or ratio of salt water there is to fresh water in the aquifer? Now, salt water is gonna sink because it's more dense. Salt water will always be on the bottom. So when we go out and measure the Withlacoochee River, for example, there's a saltwater wedge that comes up, and the St. John's River is the same thing. You'll find the saltier water at the bottom, the fresher water at the top, because salt water is denser. And that's the way the aquifer is. The, salt, the saltier water will generally sink, you know, if, if, it can, if the water can move, which you can't always do in the aquifer, it'll be deeper. Um, and at the coast, uh, as you pull, you know, at the coast, at Kings Bay now, half the springs are salty. Uh, they got connectivities in the thousands. And you get barnacles on, in places in Kings Bay and Crystal River where you never got barnacles on your boats in the past. It was a freshwater system. You'd love to go boating there because you put in in fresh water, you went out in salt water, and you came back and your boat got completely rinsed off before you loaded it on your trailer. It's not the way it is anymore. It's changed remarkably because this interface has, is moving inland at the coast. Because we're pumping this surface down, it, it flat, it's flattest at the coast, and it's just getting flatter and flatter, and so that this interface is getting, the, the, the thickness of the freshwater lens is very, very thin. Water is unique, thank God for water. Uh, it's, it's everything that we do here is water, uh, so understanding uh, the chemistry of it's very important and how it interacts with light. Uh, that's what we have, we have several interns here today that are uh, studying with us this summer, so they're going out in the field and actually doing this firsthand. We have a, a lady that would like to have a lab to help us do a lab sometime. We have another lab director here that's helped us in the past at Silver Spring. Uh, so we need to learn a lot more about our water. We are drinking water that's got elevated levels of nitrate in it.